mode. Hey everybody, Dr. Wohler here for Integrated Medicine Academy. I'm here also for Great Plains Lab and the Great Plains Laboratory uh, complimentary monthly webinar. So I was thinking about this lecture and what I want to talk about. Obviously this title, Clinical Considerations When Reviewing an Oat Test, could open a lot of doors to a lot of areas and we know the oat is a large test. So I thought we'd focus on a few interesting areas that I think are important clinically in practice and the more comfortable you get interpreting the organic acid test of sort of a, another layer that opens up to you. So for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm, I've been an integrative and functional medicine physician for going on 24 years now. And I do a lot of clinical education for Great Plans. I've been doing these monthly webinars for years. I also am part of their GPL Academy in teaching OAT and other testing. <clears throat> but I also have my own academy called Integrated Medicine Academy, which is an online academy with uh, various courses in integrated medicine for health practitioners. I do a lot of speaking, a lot of education. I'm also a practicing clinician, so I work with individuals on the autism spectrum, autoimmune diseases, neurological problems, et cetera. And then I'm medical director of something called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, which I'll share with you here shortly. Okay, so the, the organic acid test. So there's a lot to this. I'm assuming people who are listening uh, are using this test, maybe getting introduced to this test, uh, and are looking for some additional information. So let's go through a little bit of that. What I thought I would do is touch on a few specific topics. So each one of these categories, by the way, we could create an entire lecture around. So I'm gonna, I wanna do something a little bit different. I wanted to kind of see if we could weave our way through some of this, where we could look at some of these markers from a little bit deeper level, or perhaps look at certain scenarios that aren't quite as obvious as to what the test might indicate. So we're going to talk about the yeast fungal markers section. I'll tie in a little bit of information on Clostridia bacterial markers. That more is going to be in tune with how it can manipulate things within the phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolites. And then we'll wrap up talking a little bit about ketone fatty acid oxidation, at least a few markers in that section and how that might relate to a marker we sometimes see elevated all up by itself in the indicators of detoxification section. Okay, so let's start with the yeast and fungal markers. So a common question is, is you know, if the, if the mold markers, I, I, th I already see a misprint, it always drives me nuts. It's, that's supposed to be markers, not makers. Anyway. Um, if the mold markers on the oat, okay, um, if they're normal, does that mean that the person that the test comes from doesn't have mold or some type of mycotoxin exposure? So here's a common scenario, right? You do an organic acid test, it comes back, and you know it has what you kind of expected, right? It's got the arabinosis high indicating, you know, some invasive candida. But then you kind of pick up on some other markers, right? We've got markers two, four, five, and six. When these are present, it indicates that there's been some type of aspergillus mold exposure. And when they're elevated on the yoke, it's, it's definitely suggesting that you're getting some gut colonization of aspergillus, which means that your patient has swallowed the mold spores into the digestive tract, they've colonized the digestive tract and then are producing these organic acids or these organic acids get produced because of the presence of that mold. So when you think about mold exposure, people can react to the mold spore. Uh, they can react to certain components of the mold. Let's say it gets into the lung and it causes irritation within the respiratory system. So just local irritation can cause coughing and inflammation and then people you know react in a way where they react to what are called uh, 
uh, volatile compounds that these molds also produce. They also can generate inflammation. They can generate an infectious response in the body. And then these molds can also produce mycotoxins. And the mycotoxins are they're separate from the mold. They came from the mold, but they're different chemicals. And these organic acids that you're seeing on the oat, such as this one here, the 5 hydroxy methyl 2 fluoric that is an organic acid. It's not a mycotoxin from the mold. So either way, when you look at a test like this, you know that your person, the patient's been exposed. Now, you don't know if it's coming from food or if it's coming from the environment or both, unless, of course, they either tell you they visually see mold in their home or their office, or they've got a lot of respiratory issues, which might raise your suspicion. Okay, so that's a fairly common scenario. But what you don't want to do is just assume that this person also has mycotoxins that would be associated with these markers. So, but in this particular case, what's kind of interesting is that the mycotoxins are present. Okay, so we actually see elevations of ochratoxin. We also see gliotoxin, which is actually linked to aspergillus mold. And we see elevations of mycophenolic uh, as well as uh, zeolianon, which is linked to fusarium mold. So that lines up pretty strongly with what this individual's organic acid test showed, right? So there, this person actually on their oat test had markers two, four, five, and six, all being linked to aspergillus mold. And they also had the corresponding mycotoxins, or at least some of them. They also had tricarboxylic, another organic acid that's linked to fusarium mold. And they had one of the fusarium mycotoxins that the mycotox profile analyzes for, which was the zeolianon, if I pronounced that right. I have a hard time with that word, okay? So pretty straightforward. But then there are those scenarios, like this individual, where you look at page one of the oat, and you go, well, it looks pretty good, right? You know, candida, the arabinose is high normal, but everything else is fine. In fact, markers two, four, five, and six are totally normal, as well as the tricarboxylic. And where you can get into trouble is assuming that everything is fine from a fungal standpoint, so therefore I don't need to do the mycotox profile because clearly there's not gonna be mycotoxins. Well, that's where we can get into trouble because many people can be harboring mycotoxins from previous exposure to mold. The mold spore or the organism is no longer present, no longer around, no longer colonizing the gut, but the, but it produced the mycotoxins, which is now stored in the patient's body. And these mycotoxins, we know, can get into our cells, hide out, and, and you know, pretty much exist for a prolonged period of time. So we can see this person actually is holding on to okra toxin as well as gliotoxin. Now, this particular case was kind of interesting in that this was the original test done on the same day, I think it was the same day, yeah, it was actually a day afterwards, but at the same time frame in March of that year. But they didn't have anything else happening, right? So if we take a look at this, we see that the penicillium mycotoxins are normal, the stachybotrys mycotoxins are normal, fusarium is normal, et cetera. But about three months down the road, a repeat test was done. And now we see more mycotoxins showing up. And one of the things that none of us can do is predict or control is what our patients are going to do, what they're going to be exposed to, how consistent they are with the treatment programs that we provide for them, and how compliant they are. And that doesn't mean that the person is doing anything wrong. Sometimes people's situation changes, they get a new job, they get a new house, they're exposed to new things which is what was happening in this particular case. But here, here's the problem that could happen is if something wasn't repeated, right? A repeat test wasn't done for the mycotoxin or 
the mycotoxin test was never not done because the organic acid test showed all normals for mold markers. Well, this person is now being exposed to stachybotrys mold, which is clearly problematic. And there are no markers on the oat test that are indicative of stachybotrys. So the only way to actually detect it is through the mycotox profile. And I've actually had a number of cases now where people didn't even know they were being exposed to stachybotrys. And I actually had one scenario where his two kids were being exposed to it in their home because of black mold growing behind a leak behind the dishwasher in their kitchen. So stachybotrys is a highly toxic mold that actually needs a lot of water in order to thrive, a lot of humidity. And the problem is, is that it creates these compounds called trichothecenes. And these trichothecenes are extremely toxic, particularly neurotoxic. They can be damaged to the mitochondria as well. And so a Riordan E and Verucarin A sometimes show up on the mycotox test, but don't expect to see any evidence, at least on the mold marker section or the page one of the oat that is reflective of this. You might pick up on mitochondrial markers that are high, but those, mito those mitochondrial markers on the, on the organic acid test could be elevated for many, for many reasons. Mycotoxins for one, but it could be chemicals, could be nutritional deficiencies, et cetera. This person was also being exposed now to fusarium mycotoxin of zeolianon and the citronine, which is this one here is almost always associated with some type of mold exposure environmentally. So the bottom line here is when we start to think about things clinically, the organic acid test is fundamental, right? It's going to give us insight into yeast and fungal markers, cluster D markers, and all of the other things that go on metabolically in the body that are analyzed on this test. But we can't use the oat to rule out doing the mycotox profile. It can certainly suggest that mycotoxins are present, because of those mold markers, but sometimes you're gonna get a patient where those fungal markers are normal and they're just still retaining high mycotoxins. So the point is, is the both really need to be done. Um, and uh, again, we can get ourselves into trouble sometimes in just assuming that we don't need to do a follow-up test because the organic acid test, you know, wasn't showing anything. Okay, so another scenario. Okay, so now we're gonna, let's look at the ketone and fatty acid oxidation markers. So here's a consideration. Okay, and this is a consideration for elevated 3-hydroxybutyric and, and acetoacetic acids. When you look at the ketone fatty acid section, the first thing that, that you should think about is that this particular section of the organic acid test does have a link to the mitochondrial sections on page three of the oat. Now, for many people, the most common marker you'll see is subaric. You know, commonly high, often associated with some type of overnight fast. And one of the reasons is, is that subaric gets produced by oleic acid, which is the main form of uh, fat that's stored in our adipose tissue. Okay, so you'll, you'll commonly see that marker. Sometimes you'll see a diptych high, common with gelatin or junk food consumption, for example, people who are eating a lot, not a really healthy diet. A diptych acid sometimes is in antacids, for example, like tongue, uh, not tongues, but antacids or other, um, other, other things like tongues, for example. We also know that this section of the organic acid test can be influenced by diet. So it's not uncommon, by the way, to see somebody who's using a lot of coconut oil in their cooking or medium chain triglyceride oil for whatever reason, whether they're putting it into their coffee or using it as an anti-yeast remedy, can many times sort of inflate these numbers kind of across the board on the O test. But then you gotta dig a little bit deeper when you start seeing scenarios like this, okay? 
43 and 44 are strong indicators of something like a ketogenic diet. Could be somebody who has diabetes or maybe pre-diabetic. Somebody is in a long state of fasting, for example, sometimes can inflate these early numbers here. And whenever you see a situation where you're seeing 43 and 44 much higher than everything else, it sort of begs the question, is there something metabolic going on that I need to look further? Is it possible this is something that is being influenced by their diet? Is this an autistic child who's doing a specific carbohydrate diet, or is this an adult who's doing a ketogenic diet? So that's easy enough to ask your patients when you see these kind of things high. In some cases, the levels can be extremely high. Okay, and so notice how much more elevated 3-hydroxybutyric and acetoacetic are than everything else. Well, Keep this in mind in that fats, carbohydrates, and proteins, right? All of this stuff is moving towards the mitochondria to help produce energy because we're producing energy to help make ATP, which is that cellular energy currency we need to run our body, our brain, our nervous system, our musculoskeletal system, our, our, our cardiovascular system. And our brain and nervous system and our cardiovascular system need a tremendous amount of ATP to function normally. And so a lot of it ends, I'm gonna get a different color pen here. Let's see, let's go with purple. A lot of it ends at the level of acetyl coenzyme A. Okay, so we know that certain amino acids can be funneled down to acetyl coenzyme A, and we also move carbohydrates uh, down to that level, and then of course fats and lipids can become there as well. And this is one of the main entry points into our citric acid cycle. When you look a little bit deeper from a biochemical standpoint, this, I, I actually like this slide because it, it shows us branch chain amino acid oxidation so valine, isoleucine, leucine, as well as fatty acid oxidation. And if you come all the way down to the bottom, we've got acetyl coenzyme A that gets produced because of amino acid metabolism. We've got acetyl coenzyme A that gets produced because of fatty acid oxidation metabolism. And of course, we know that acetyl coenzyme A gets produced because of glucose metabolism as well. Some of these others, like um, propionyl coenzyme A and acetoacetic, are other types of fuel sources that also can support um, body metabolism. So, for example, um, propionyl coenzyme A enters the Krebs cycle at a different location than the acetyl coenzyme A does, and it, it has its own links to isoleucine and valine metabolism. Acetoacetic is a secondary fuel source, or I should say an alternative fuel source for tissues you know, outside the liver, primarily to help support the brain and nervous system during the states of ketosis. So the process of ketosis, you know, where we produce 3-hydroxybutyric or acetoacetic is very important as a secondary fuel source. In fact, uh, when all of us are our newborns, um, actually there's, and it occurs even earlier than that, but we all produce high amounts of these, uh, these ketones because um, these ketones are also important for the stimulation um, and production of phospholipids as well as myelin production and brain growth in, in children. So, there is a relationship to these things to normal metabolism, but then they can be influenced or induced because of diet, but then they can also be linked to underlying metabolic disorders. So it, it really comes down, you, you always can't tell when you're looking at an oat test, you always have to apply that information and get some clinical information from your patient. So for example, 3-hydroxybutyric 
can occur because of ketosis from somebody doing a ketogenic diet or a specific carbohydrate diet. But it could be happening because somebody's diabetic. In fact, they use 3-hydroxybutyric as one of the things to monitor for something called diabetic ketoacidosis. Acetoacetic tends to follow suit, right? So we're getting a, a, a breakdown of fat producing acetoacetic, just like we do 3-hydroxybutyric as a secondary fuel source. One interesting thing about acetoacetic is that it can form acetone. And acetone will give that nail polish smell to sometimes to people's breath or even their urine. So this particular slide is showing us that free fatty acids, okay, get produced into acetylcoenzyme A, which can funnel down to help produce acetoacetic and 3-hydroxybutyric okay, as a fuel source for extrahepatic tissues in the body. So when they says extrahepatic, that's outside the liver. Think brain nervous system, for example, okay, or other, you know, other organ systems throughout the body. And then again, you know, I, I, that sort of nail polish breath smell can be linked to acetone production. So acetone is a ketone. So when I look at an oat test and I see those first two markers in the fatty acid metabolite section really high, right? I wanna know more about my patient's health condition. If it's in a child, are they, you know, is it an autistic child? Is somebody doing something with their diet or do they have some kind of metabolic disease? If it's an adult, well, does this, again, does this person have a history of diabetes? Or do they have malnutrition? Are they malabsorbing? Okay, all of these factors come into play. Um, and once you're able to tie in some of the clinical information, the markers start to make more sense or bring more meaning to the picture. If you've ever looked at the indicators of detoxification section of the organic acid test, there is another marker called 2-hydroxybutyric. And <clears throat> one of the things that's commonly discussed with regards to this marker is it's linked to low glutathione. And I've even commented about this too, particularly in, in the OAT seminars that we do. So when you look at indicators of detox, it has these two markers that have an asterisk next to them, pyroglutamic and 2-hydroxybutyric. When pyroglutamic is high, it indicates a glutathione deficiency. When 2-hydroxybutyric is high, one of the reasons it can be high is because the body is attempting to maintain glutathione levels. Okay, so that's certainly a possibility. And when that occurs, or at least there's a suspicion of that, you have to ask yourself the question, well, why? What might be causing the body to try to increase glutathione status? Well, there are other markers on the oat that can indicate at least the possibility of environmental exposure. So if you look back on page three, under the Krebs cycle metabolites, we've got succinic, which has a very strong association to chemical toxins. So in this particular person where we've got both pyroglutamic and 2-hydroxybutyric elevated, it's indicating a strong glutathione deficiency, very likely secondary to chemical exposures. Heavy metal exposures would be a possibility too. So that would be the most common reason, right? So we're a lot of times in the early phase of identifying or we're learning about the O test is trying to focus on what's most common because again, that's what most commonly you're gonna see in your practice. But there are other reasons that 2-hydroxybutyric could be elevated, right? There can be other imbalances that are putting a strain on the methylation cycle. So for example, if we take a look at the methylation cycle, 
I always like this slide because I can draw a line underneath homocysteine. So here is our folate cycle, here's our methylation cycle, and here's our transsulfuration cycle. And so if everything is working the way it should and things are balanced, we're going to get good conversion of homocysteine to methionine. We're going to get um, flow from 5-methyl-THF to tetrahydrofolate becomes 5-10-methyl-tetrahydrofolate. This goes off to support DNA and RNA. Right, we get adequate conversion of homocysteine to methionine, and on the back end, we get conversion back from methionine to homocysteine, which allows us to also support DNA and protein development. So that system's working fine. And then we, we have a balance that happens below that. So if the transsulfuration system is balanced, we'll get good bile salt production, we'll get good sulfation production to support liver detox, and we'll get good glutathione production. But when the, the system is stressed, okay, so if we're being inundated with a lot of toxins, whether that's internally produced toxins or externally derived toxins from the environment, there's going to be an increased demand for glutathione, right? And so basically to get glutathione produced, with, with regards to the methylation cycle, we're gonna be pulling on the homocysteine to move down to produce that glutathione because we need to be able to take cysteine, combine it with glutamic acid and glycine to make glutathione. So that's a common scenario, right? Increased 2-hydroxybutyric is often elevated because of an increased demand for glutathione production. Well, what are some other factors? There are some other genetic factors which are they're less common. Then we get into things like diabetes or even excessive alcohol use. Okay. Those two could have an influence on 2-hydroxybutyric. So whenever you see a situation where the 2-hydroxybutyric is elevated by itself, and you can tell in this particular case, this is well above the second standard deviation. That's, a, that's a, actually a really high marker for 2-hydroxybutyric. Our, our pyroglutamic is actually normal. What is the situation? Well, the test doesn't really tell us, right? We have to look at it and go, well, the most common reason would be because we're trying to maintain glutathione levels. But there could be another possible reason here. And this is where you can use the OAT to link to other markers. And then also you have to do some clinical digging with your patient. You've got to talk to them about their lifestyle. Are they diabetic? Are they excessively using alcohol? These types of things. <clears throat> so 2-hydroxybutyric is an early marker for insulin resistance, okay, impaired glucose regulation. It is often found as well in those who are undergoing ketosis, okay? That could also mean diabetic ketoacidosis. So it's actually a selective marker for impaired glucose tolerance. Now, notice that this article is talking about alpha-hydroxybutyric, whereas the, the test itself lists it as 2-hydroxyhyperic. Well, the terminology comes down to organic chemistry, okay? And so the alpha carbon, is the, the carbon that's basically right adjacent to what's called a functional group. In this particular example, they're talking about a carbonyl. Um, basically, a carbonyl is where we have a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. That's called a carbonyl group. This particular group is an alcohol group. So this would be a functional group of this fatty acid. This is where this image is coming from. 
Some of the organic acids will list things either as alpha, beta, gamma, or they'll list it as, you know, uh, two, three, four, depending on what carbon um, uh, they're referring to. So in this particular case, alpha hydroxybutyric, okay, is two hydroxybutyric because here's carbon one, here's carbon two, here's carbon three, here's carbon four. So that's where the designations come from, from an organic acid standpoint. When they talk about beta oxidation of these fatty acids, right? They're talking about this carbon right here. So if this was carbon one, this is carbon two, well, this is gonna be carbon three. So three hydroxybutyric, for example, would be a representative or a, um, an associated you know, fatty acid that goes through beta oxidation. So here's a scenario, right? We've got somebody who's got very high levels of 3-hydroxybutyric. This would also be called beta-hydroxybutyric. They have high levels of subaric. They have high levels of 2-hydroxybutyric. This would also be called alpha-hydroxybutyric. So coming from an individual actually with a poor uh, glucose metabolism, poor diet, alcohol consumption. So kind of a typical uh, individual that we might see that's just uh, not real healthy, not eating a, a healthy diet, for example. It's interesting if you sort of piece apart the subaric, right? Well, subaric comes from oleic acid, which is the main fat stored in our adipose tissue. Well, if, if the body is attempting to get, you know, adequate fuel source and it's not able to, you know, sort of metabolize glucose appropriately because of, you know, insulin resistance, et cetera, we're going to start pulling fatty acids into this, into circulation and try to generate these, uh, these ketones as a secondary fuel source. Well, we might also start to see, you know, some access of, you know, fat stores from adipose tissue as well. What do you make of elevated lactic acid in a scenario like this? Well, one of the things we know is that that really high levels of 3-hydroxybutyric or acetoacetic through metabolic acidosis can also be a contributing factor to lactic acidosis. And now we know that lactic acidosis can occur for many reasons. So it can occur from excessive exercise, for example. One of the things that's often talked about in the seminars is mold exposure as well. The reality is there's many causes of lactic acidosis. Some of these things would be relatively easy to figure out based on the clinical presentation of your patient, right? If they came into your office, it's not likely they're dealing with cardiogenic shock or hypovolemic shock. Most people we see in our functional and integrative medicine practices are dealing with what's called a type B lactic acidosis. It could be induced from medications. It could be from thiamine deficiencies. It could be from excessive exercise, diabetic ketoacidosis, ethanol intoxication. The thiamine deficiency scenario is kind of interesting. And one of the things that I've been researching a lot is the issues behind thiamine deficiency. In fact, if you're interested, um, I'm gonna be doing a webinar next week on September 10th through our Integrated Medicine Academy on dysautonomia and thiamine deficiency. This has a, a, a lot of relevance for people who are dealing with chronic mitochondrial issues, chronic neurological problems, including mental health issues, autism, because this umbrella term of dysautonomia is actually quite prevalent. We know that Postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which can occur from a deficiency of dopamine beta hydroxylase, would fall into the category of a dysautonomia. But there's 
The thiamine component is very interesting biochemically. We talk a lot about this in my advanced organic acid test mastery course uh, and where thiamine lines up biochemically with regards to amino acid, fatty acid, and carbohydrate metabolism. So you can register for this webinar at integrativemedicineacademy.com slash webinar. And again, that'll be done next week. Well, what about the tyrosine phenylalanine metabolite section? Okay, so what are some considerations when you see high homovanillic acid? So if you've looked at the O, you'll know on page two is this graph. And if you learn how to use this graph, you can kind of piece things together with regards to this section of the O. So here is homovanillic acid. Here's dopamine. We know we can influence dopamine levels by inputting phenylalanine or tyrosine. We can affect L-DOPA, for example, uh, because of the input of these amino acids. And then DOPA becomes dopamine, right? So dopamine, if things were, if things were balanced in the body, we're gonna get dopamine being converted to norepinephrine. Dopamine would get converted to epinephrine through the actions of S-adenosylmethionine, and then would have normal levels, balanced levels of vanillomandelic acid. We're also gonna get some dopamine that goes through the dopac to become homovanillic acid, right? So just as a normal metabolite, things are gonna go off in both directions. So that's the way things should work. We've got dopamine beta hydroxylase, which is the enzyme that helps us convert dopamine to norepinephrine. If something's going on on this enzyme, if there's a vitamin C deficiency or a copper deficiency, that could affect the function of the enzyme, causing it to drop. There's some other factors too. There's a, a mycotoxin called fusaric acid, which comes from fusarium mole that can affect it. We also know that people can have genetic influences on dopamine beta hydroxylase. And so if the dopamine beta hydroxylase activity is altered, okay, it's gonna block, or at least block at least partially the function of dopamine beta hydroxylase. That's gonna decrease our ability to convert dopamine to norepinephrine and cause our dopamine levels to increase, which would then cause our dopac levels to increase causing our homovanillic acid levels to increase. One of the major things that inhibits dopamine beta hydroxylase is clostridia bacteria and the clostridia markers on the O. And so this was an individual I had just consulted with recently. Um, we can see on the organic acid test, there's really not a lot of stuff going on in the yeast and fungal section got a little bit of arabinose, but the person does have elevations of HPA, okay? HPHPA HPA is, the, is the most common clostridium marker you'll see on the organic acid test. When we look at the neurotransmitter metabolites, this person has very high levels of homovanillic acid. They also have high levels of dopac, right? So if we go back to that graph and we think about dopamine, dopamine to, uh, let's see, norepinephrine occurs because of the dopamine beta hydroxylase. Well, that dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme is getting affected probably because of the clostridia toxins, right? The HPHPA could block the enzyme. So this causes our dopamine levels to rise and the dopamine then flows through dopac, which then flows to HVA. So we've got high HVA, high dopac, in the presence of HPHPA from the clostridia. So that would be 
a fairly common type scenario that we see. Notice how low the VMA, the vanille mandelic acid is. So there's quite a spread between our HVA and our VMA, which is causing our ratio levels to be very high. When we go back in time, this individual had actually done a note test a couple of years prior. Notice that there was nothing going on in the Clostridia department. We had a little bit of candida. A lot of people have candida, okay? Um, it, but it's not something that's gonna be influencing the dopamine beta hydroxylase. Here is the neurotransmitter section for that time. Do you see anything out of balance? Well, our homovanillic acid clearly is not elevated like it was before, but it's definitely high normal. But our mandelic or vanillandilic acid is actually low normal. In fact, this marker really hasn't changed much. It's pretty much just existed in this range at a low level between the two tests over a couple year period of time, okay? The ratio is not as high because the HVA is not as high. So what's going on? It's clearly not happening because of the clostridia. In fact, when we actually put both of these side by side, we can see the, the one in 2018, we have a, you know, a high normal HVA and a low normal VMA a slight elevation of the ratio. But over here, now the HVA is very high. But notice the VMA hasn't changed at all. In fact, the spread between HVA and VMA has just got wider. Okay, and you know the, this is sort of a scenario in, in many regards where you've got an individual who likely has some type of genetic issue happening in the dopamine beta hydroxylase. At least that's the, the theory we're running with right now as we look to get additional testing. So you can have individuals who have just low activity of dopamine beta hydroxylase because of genetic factors, but then you can pour on, you know, clostridia toxins on top of it and it just accentuates the issue. If you look at the list of things linked to low activity of dopamine beta hydroxylase, whether it's occurring genetically or whether it's being induced because of some other factor, clostridia, for example, these things have a strong association to mental health disorders, to exercise intolerance, to low blood pressure, to autism, to, to Parkinson's, to Alzheimer's, low muscle tone, seizure disorders, postural orthostatic, tachycardia syndrome, even dysautonomia. Now, some of these things you can only figure out, you know, over time when you've been able to repeat organic acid tests to see how, to see how things uh, pan out. This was just a, a good example of being able to get two different oat tests over a couple of years period of time and seeing that the, the vanilla mandelic acid linked to norepinephrine has always been low and it actually fits much of this individual's clinical presentation, for example. So the dopamine beta hydroxylase test is a blood test from Great Plains and uh, Dr. Shaw had just actually come out and commented on online, I think you actually talked about it in a lecture, that this particular test can be done even in the existence, in the presence of clostridia bacteria. So the test is specifically looking at the function of dopamine beta hydroxylase related to genetic factors. So anyway, uh, if you haven't read about the, read about this test yet, make sure you do so. You can access actually this information 
right here that I took as a screen capture right off the Great Plains Laboratory web, uh, website under select a test, go to dopamine beta hydroxylase enzyme activity test and you'll see, you'll see these things right there. Okay, so that's some things that I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, if you hadn't had a chance to check out the GPL Academy with um, many of the different conferences that Great Plains puts on, you can go to gplworkshops.com. I do, I do a lot of education through there as well. And then we have our own courses through Integrated Medicine Academy. So I actually have my own course called Essential Oat Mastery, which is on the fundamental aspects of the organic acid test. Uh, we go into the organic acid test uh, very in depth, where I actually can uh, talk about things in, in an extended way where we're looking at the, the markers that are most commonly seen on the oat test. Um, actually, we're, at, we're currently in the middle of a, an essential oat mastery course, but people can purchase access to these courses at any time. So if you want more information about the essential oat mastery course, you can text EOAT to 66866. There's a special report link that will be sent to you. And then our advanced oat mastery course, where some of this information I just shared with you today comes from, um, is very in-depth. We actually go through every single marker on the organic acid test. Um, a part of this test, too, we get into um, how to clinically correlate information from the different categories, the different scenarios of why many of these markers can be high, even some of the rare ones, which are linked to genetic disorders as well. So a lot of clinical relevance in both the essential and the advanced oat mastery course. If you've not been, by the way, to a GPL Academy event, or you haven't been, you know, if you're just starting off doing the organic acid test, I would strongly recommend you not jump into the advanced oat mastery material. You really need to go through the essential foundational information first. And, and if you've maybe stepped away from the oat test for a while and just getting back to it, um, you know, you could use the essential oat mastery course as a refresher. So we actually have a new version of the advanced oat mastery course coming up in October. Uh, we're currently in a, uh, we're actually currently in an advanced oat mastery course right now. We just completed module 10. There's 12 modules to the advanced oat course. Again, people can access the courses at any time. All of the material is, is done live and then recorded for later viewing. But again, there is a, another one starting in October. If you want more information about the advanced oat course, you can text AOAT to 66866 and you'll get a special report. And you can, of course, go to each course's website and just read about it and, and reach out to if it, reach out to us if you have any questions. We also have a, a new website called Functional Medicine Clinical Rounds, and what this site is is an access for healthcare practitioners to have one-on-one -on -one consults with myself and my partner, Dr. Trencatello. So we have pr practitioners who are now part of this. It is a mentoring um, service to work with us one-on-one -on -one regarding uh, patients or clients that you see through your practice. If you have questions, if you have you know, case scenarios, if you want just another pair of eyes, you want to go through some lab testing. I, we do ex extensive lab reviews on Great Plains and other, other labs, doctor's data, ZRT, hormone profiles, these types of things. We also have uh, bi-weekly educational videos, case studies, clinical pearls, um, and then we also provide discounts on our mastery courses. So you can get more information about functionalist and clinicalrounds.com and also learn through the website how to book consults with us as well. So there's also a forum. So we actually have uh, an active forum where you can post questions to us on a daily basis with regards to things that you're 
seeing in your practice. And then we just initiated a monthly live clinical rounds. So the clinical rounds is a webinar format. So usually about 20, 25 minutes, we'll do either a case presentation, a lab review, a topic of interest. Um, many times people who are members actually submit a lab test to be reviewed. And then we open it up for question and answers. And then we just added, um, which I think is a really cool thing, these things called clinical, clinical data sheets, these pearls for your practice. And basically what these are, are these, these pearls on test interpretation clinical scenarios. So we can take snapshots of an organic acid test and show certain markers that might be elevated and what are some of the clinical indicators that you might consider based on those markers. So we do these for a lot of different tests, not only oat tests, but stool, metal testing, hormone testing, et cetera. And these are all available for download within the website. So clinical medicine, uh, clin functionalmedicineclinicalrounds.com. And then uh, anybody needing access to, to lab tests, uh, there is a website called labtestplus.com uh, that provides people an opportunity to order some of the tests from Great Plains. And then when the results have been established, we actually do what's called a written review of, of findings on the, on the pertinent markers for the O, for many of the other Great Plains labs and, and other, other companies as well. So labtestplus.com. You can also email to lab test plus at gmail.com for questions. And then I'm always available for private consultations as well through our private practice, which is called Sunrise Functional Medicine. There's our website, phone number and email. Oops, let me go back real quick. So what will happen is if anybody submitted questions, um, Great Plains will send them to me. I, I reply to them as best as possible via email after the fact, it usually takes a few days to gather these things. But uh, there's other avenues of, of for you to reach out to us too with any questions you have. So I appreciate everybody's uh, attention today. And I hope that this was interesting information, perhaps helpful as well, is always my goal. Um, I love doing these webinars. I, I really enjoy education. I love teaching about the OAT and all the different clinical applications of this test and other testing. Okay, everybody. So again, this is Dr. Kerr-Wohler. Thanks so much for joining me today. We'll see you uh, another time. Take care.